Prodigal by Josh Reynolds Fabius Bile hummed with quiet satisfaction and studied the tiny shapes floating in the half-dozen man-sized nutrient tanks. The children were scrawny things, culled from the lower hives of free worlds, but there was a fierce potential in them which stirred his somnolent creativity. It had been some time, and he was glad to find that the fires of ingenuity had not been utterly snuffed, as he sometimes feared. The systems of the laboratorium flickered as Vesalius slipped into the obscuring depths of warp space. The ancient Gladius-class frigate was his personal vessel, claimed in some long-ago raid on a forgotten world. Its former name had been stripped from it, as had every trace of its previous owners. Now and forever, it was simply Vesalius. Whatever cruel spirit now haunted its core seemed happy enough with the name, which was just as well. Bio was not in the habit of letting his tools dictate their own designations, however useful they may be. This is the responsibility of the Creator, he said, as he thumbed a flickering hololithic projector. To name a thing is to lay out its purpose. He looked around, ensuring all was in its proper place. Magnetized trays of surgical equipment, much of it designed by Baal himself, occupied the walls, alongside diverse charts documenting his ongoing experiments and various observations. Enhanced picked captures of in-progress dissections jostled for space with chemical readouts and scraps of poetry culled from worlds without number. Beauty, drawn from amidst the wreckage, poetry like music, was a passion of his, a holdover from ancient days and associations, comforting in its familiarity. The laboratorium was his private fiefdom aboard the vessel, the one place where he could be alone, free from the squabbling factionalism of his servants. It was his own fault, for fostering a climate of healthy competition among the crew. Necessary though it might be, only the strongest survived in this galaxy. And you will be strong, my children. It is writ in your very blood. He studied his reflection in the void-hardened glass of the tanks. A thin face looked back, sallow and marked by scar tissue and minor inflammation around the nodal insertion points that dotted his skull. Metallic, arachnid limbs topped by blades, sores and glistening syringes rose over his hunched frame, twitching in time to some faint modulation. The skull-topped scepter he leaned on glowed faintly with an unnatural radiance. Power thrummed through it, sinister and greedy. It yearned to be used. An amplifier, its slightest touch could elicit a raging torrent of agony in even the strongest subject. Hence its name, Torment. Even clad in power armour, Bile was gaunt, like a parasite hunched inside the hollowed-out body of its victim. The deep purple of the ceramite had faded to a dull hue, and bare patches of grey showed through in places where it was not hidden beneath his coat of stretched, screaming faces. Like the ostentatious name of his scepter, the coat was a sign of an instinctual theatrical indulgence. Such a monstrous whimsy was hardwired into the genetics of the Third Legion, as much a part of them as their hair colour and pallor. It cannot be helped, I suppose. Blood will out. He activated his armour's vox recorder. It was an old habit, and one he saw no reason to break. Even the most mundane of his musings were of value, he found. Idle fancies on the nature of prognoid cultivation could be traded to lesser apothecaries for substantial gains, in raw materials or even necessary technologies. His researches were responsible for the survival of more than one legion lurking in eye space, whether they'd admit it or not, and most wouldn't. His name was a curse among his brothers. They had their reasons. No man loves the surgeon who removes his limb, gangrenous or not. Fortunately, Bile did not require love. He required isolation and respect, two things he had in abundance, for the moment, at least.
He traded his skills as an apothecary for protection, for resources, for whatever he needed. He bore no grudges from his previous life, no old hostilities. The Legion Wars were done, and whatever martial ambitions he might once have harboured with them. All things end. That is the nature of this universe. All of us are destined to be ash, scattered across sand. All save you, and those who will come after. Bile peered into the nutrient tanks, taking note of the changes already being wrought on those youthful physiologies. He had perfected the implantation of certain organs and glands, necessary to the extension and expansion of human potential. While these children would not become the ideal, as exemplified by a space marine, they would be more than human, and best of all, completely stable. They would be stronger, faster, more aggressive than the standard template, more suited for survival in this harsh universe. We are deceptively fragile things, my brothers and I. We stand as citadels, our bastions replete with hidden flaws and weaknesses. At our height we might have ruled, but now we crumble, like all things must. But in our ruination is the seed of what might be. That was his work now, his great responsibility, to improve upon the flawed designs of those who'd come before and seed the stars with a new man, one adapted to the grim darkness of the current millennium. The children in the nutrient tanks would be among the first generation of that new species. The alterations he was making to them would be passed along, down through their progeny, to future generations. They were the foundation stones of his new race, chosen for viability and adaptability. And you will thank me, he said. You will know me and venerate my works, for I shall not abandon you as my father abandoned me and his father him. Wherever you go, wherever you triumph, I shall be at your side, one hand upon your shoulders. For am I not your progenitor? Did I not pluck you from obscurity to raise you chosen up? as I have your brothers and sisters. Vesalius's hold was full of cryogenic sarcophagi of his own design, each one containing a sleeping body. Children mostly, some older, some younger. The flesh tithe, his servants called it. He had worked miracles upon many worlds, and those worlds repaid him in raw materials. The first-born sons and daughters of noble houses slumbered beside orphans taken from industrial factory worlds, or feral children who had once roamed the underhives of a dozen worlds. Some came willingly, aware of the honour of being selected. Others had to be rounded up by his servants on those worlds. Over the centuries, he had seeded innumerable worlds with his creations, clones, transhumans, specially bred mutants. They saw to his will. They ruled in his name, or twisted planetary bureaucracies to suit his needs. Some served simply to ensure that planetary defence fleets patrolled a certain sector on a certain cycle, or to hide evidence of his genetic harvest among their tithing to the bloodless inheritors of the legacies of the legions of the first founding. It would not do for the tottering husk of the Imperium to discover the full extent of his activities, and his creations worked to protect his secrets. All were his children, in spirit if not in biology. As you are my children, he said, to the shapes slumbering in their nutrient tanks, his smile of satisfaction faltered. Once there had been another who might have claimed that distinction, a daughter of his flesh, drawn fully grown from his womb vats and draped in damask and silk. Her face filled his mind's eye for a moment before he banished it. His first true creation, and possibly his last, unique in all the galaxy, built from blood and possibility. Wherever she was, she was no use to him now. He felt no anger at the thought she had chosen her path as he had created her to do. 
That her path had not been his had been a miscalculation on his part, rather than a mistake on hers. She existed, and that was enough. She lived, and her living was a sign he was not mad, whatever others claimed. Bile often pondered the matter of his sanity. While the distinction between reason and lunacy for veterans of the long war was often so minuscule as to be meaningless, he nonetheless found himself considering it at odd moments. Perhaps it was because his mind was all he had. The flesh he wore was not his original flesh. This body was not his first, nor would it be his last. The blight which clung to his genetic code even now saw to that. But his mind, his mind, was the aleph around which the entirety of his existence rotated. Without his mind, he was nothing. Behind him, something chuckled. He tensed, his grip on torment tightening. Hololithic targeting overlays shimmered to life before his eyes, and the sensor feed of his armor crackled as it became active. His hand dropped to the Zyklos needler holstered on his hip. He had designed the weapon himself. He often had a need to test new chemical concoctions under battlefield conditions. Even the smallest scratch from one of the thin darts it fired could induce madness or death. Show yourself, he said. Whatever it was likely wasn't sapient in any true fashion. Even the ones that talked were just parroting mortal responses. He wondered what sort of being it was. Sometimes things slipped past Vesalius's Gellerfield. The frigate was old and its systems often worked in strange ways. Two, the ship's machine spirit had a decidedly crude sense of humour. More than once it had led a warp entity aboard, only to trap the creature on one of the lower decks and study it at length through its internal sensors. Sometimes he suspected that Vesalius might have a first for knowledge rivalling his own. Is this another one of your pranks, Vesalius? A signal rune flashed crimson. A lifetime living in the Eye of Terror had necessitated the devising of new sorts of sensors, ones that could detect fluctuations in the very substance of reality. A slight ripple in the vitreous humour and a taste of ashes added to his growing sense of unease. The sterile air of the laboratorium was tainted by something raw and damp. Vesalius, initiate laboratorium lockdown procedure, Stannis Law Omega. Air hissed as the locking mechanisms built into the laboratorium's single bulkhead sealed. Plasteel shutters slid down, further isolating the chamber. Whatever was in here wasn't getting out until he said so. Bile drew his needler. Now... The question you must ask yourself is this. Why would I risk trapping myself in here with you? He turned, slowly, letting his targeting systems do their job. The overlays expanded and contracted, cataloguing information, closing in on the source of disturbance. Perhaps it is because I lack fear, especially of some warp-spawn scavenger. Another red rune flashed. He swung the needler around. Nothing. He ground rotting teeth in frustration. Or maybe it's confidence. I have faced the worst horrors of deep space and found them to be momentary diversions at best. A laugh, low and guttural. It reverberated through the chamber, rattling the specimen jars on their shelves. The children stirred in their tanks, as if beset by nightmares. Bile hissed in frustration. Come out now, and perhaps I will kill you before I dissect you. More laughter. Bile grimaced. Laugh if you wish, but know this. I have ways of maintaining the integrity of warp spawn, however much they wish otherwise. You might be nothing more but a figment of delirium given solidity by a random confluence of interdimensional phenomena, but I will make you howl regardless. He leveled the needler as his target overlay pinged. Even figments can bleed. As he spoke, the warp entity condensed out of empty air, a mass of teeth and tendrils. It had too many mouths, and each one was speaking in a different language. It smashed aside equipment racks and cogitator banks in its rush to grapple with him. Bile didn't move. 
He couldn't risk it damaging his nutrient tanks or the precious specimens within. The Zyklos needler hissed, peppering rubbery flesh with silvery splinters. The demon shrieked and slammed sucker-laced tendrils down on him. The force of the blow drove him to one knee, and his armor's internal monitoring system shrieked a warning. Torment clattered from his grip, growling in frustration as it rolled away. The demon flushed from pink to purple, and the cancerous mass at the heart of the lashing tendril split open to disgorge an oscillating maw of shimmering diamond-like teeth. He had no doubt that those teeth could crack ceramite. Where the needler's splinters had pierced it, its sorcerously constructed flesh was going septic, but not quickly enough. Tendrils looped about his arms and throat. With a thought, he activated the chirurgeon. He had designed the complex harness himself. It clung to his shoulders and spine with a strength that surprised even him at times, and its spidery limbs often had a will of their own. At the moment, however, it seemed inclined to obey his commands. Syringes and cutting blades lanced out as a bone drill word to life. The demon squealed in what he hoped to be pain. It was hard to tell with such creatures. Despite that, its tendrils still entangled him, and with crushing strength pulled him closer to its oscillating maw. A sweet smell like rotten fruit washed over him as the chirurgeon continued its butchery. Hissing ichor spattered cogitator consoles and specimen jars, but the demon refused to release him. Stubborn brute, as single-minded as all your kind. When he spotted the sigils branded on what passed for its flesh, he realised why. Someone had summoned this creature and sent it after him. There was no way of telling how long it had been hunting him, waiting for its moment to strike. This was not the first time such a thing had occurred, his enemies were without number and prone to excess. He tore his arm free of its coils and groped for the largest of the sigils. Its flesh felt like rubber stretched across wet sand. He dug his fingers in, trusting the ancient servos within his gauntlet to give him the strength he required. Unnatural tissue tore with a wet sound. He peeled the mark away and a coruscating smoke spewed from the wound. The demon shuddered, wailing from its many mouths. Felt that, did you? Bile said. As it thrashed, he freed the needle and took aim at the emptiness between the spinning circle of teeth. He fired, emptying the needler's cylinder. Its tendrils whipped away from him as it slammed backwards into the bulkhead. Opulescent smoke gouted from between its fangs. It was screaming now, babbling in a hundred languages, begging for mercy, cursing him, swearing vengeance, every mouth shrieking something different. He examined the twitching scrap of meat he'd harvested. He'd hoped the creature would disappear with the sigil's removal. Then there might be other bindings. The scrap pulsed in his grip, as if it might persist separate from the hole. He deposited it in an empty specimen jar. The jars were marked with such symbols as would keep the sample fresh and stable. Wiping his fingers on his coat, he retrieved torment and stalked towards the weeping, shivering mass that now slumped on the floor of the laboratorium. A rotting tendril slashed out at him, coming apart in fragrant chunks when he batted it aside with torment. Still some fight left in you. Good. At his thought, the chirurgeon clicked eagerly. Its blades gleamed as it readied itself for the harvest. The pulsating mass squirmed back from him, losing parts of itself with every undulation. He'd been right after all. It was coming apart, thanks to the excision of the binding rune. Eyes like tumours opened in its body and fixed him with a communal glare. He paused. There wasn't anger there, or even frustration. No, it was calculation, glee. Sensors shrilled a warning as something caught him around the scalp and jerked him backwards. The demon wasn't alone. He crashed down amidst steel racks of fibre bundles and prosthetic limbs, jars containing catalapsian nodes, oculobus and betches glands, toppled from their shelves and smashed to the floor around him. The waste of such valuable material sent a shrill of anger through him, and he surged up with a snarl, torment raised. A second creature, 
much like the first, spun towards him, barbed tendrils lashing. Before he could reach him, something fell upon it with a feline snarl. Bile skidded to a halt, startled by the sudden intervention. A third demon had pounced upon the second. This one was of a more highly developed breed, and its senses began to analyse its shape, cataloguing it for further study. Demons came in as many shapes as there were stars in the firmament, and no two were truly alike, despite what some sages contended. Even those with a stable manifestation often took on unique qualities, as if they were individuals rather than mere manifestations of a psychic gestalt. The newcomer tore tendrils from the oval body of its prey, splattering the walls and floor with ichors. The demon let loose a high-pitched shriek and cast its attacker aside. Before it could recover, Bile pinned it to the deck with a boot and brought torment down with bone-cracking force. The inhuman shape spasmed, venting noxious gases. Torment throbbed in his grip as he struck the warp entity again and again until it was an unrecognisable heap. The first demon surged towards him even as he stepped back, its flesh sloughed away as it lunged, teeth snapping. He smashed it from the air and trod upon it, bursting a glaring eye. It shuddered and went still. The newcomer rose to its full height with a sigh. Hello, Fabius. I felt you thinking of me. The creature smiled prettily. Her features were almost human, almost lovely, but not quite. She wore a diaphanous robe, which did little to obscure what lay beneath. Horns of glossy black, veined with red, curled tightly against either side of her narrow skull. A thick mane of stiff, quill-like hair spilled down her back and shoulders. Clawed fingers, clad in gold, dripped with the ichors of the demon she'd attacked. Eyes like red mirrors stared out of a face at once familiar and odd. A beautiful face, androgynous and strange. Once, long ago... He might have seen a similar face reflected back at him. Melusine, he said softly. Memories of a child, growing at an enhanced rate, filled his head unbidden. From fetus to adult, in a few weeks, but human-seeming, for all that he'd included other elements in her genetic makeup, at least then. His first attempt at creating something of his own, the first child of his nutrient vats, grown rather than altered. He had seen her only a few times since the day she'd left his apothecarian in Canticle City. You are much changed since last we spoke, Melazine, Bile said. Where have you been? I have been dancing in the courts of Slanesh and promenaded through the gardens of Nurgle. I have watched the fires of Korn's forges burn the horizon and traded bits of dream stuff with the caged seers of Zench. She spun in a slow pirouette as she spoke. I have been everywhere and nowhere, and now I am here. She stopped and stared at him. He recognised the look, though her eyes, her face, were different. Why? To save you. Did you get my message? I haven't sent it yet, but I thought you might have received it. She spoke at wrong angles, tangled words in awkward shapes. It had been endearing at first. Some of it was affectation, he suspected. The rest, insanity, possibly. Had she ever been sane, truly? Perhaps not. She cocked her head, studying him with goatish eyes, and he wondered if she could hear his thoughts. It wouldn't surprise him. Who knew what she might have learned in her centuries lost to the warp? He cleared his throat. Message? No. My apologies. I've been preoccupied. How are you, my dear? It hurt him somewhat to see how much his creation had altered in her time in the wilderness. She had degenerated further since the last time they'd spoken. Too much the demon, too little the mortal and less of the latter every time he saw her. One day, he might not even recognise his own handiwork. I yet persist, as you created me to do. She ran her finger along one of her horns. Do you like them? I dreamed of them waiting between worlds, and then they grew 
It hurt at first. It still hurts sometimes. When I remember what pain is. She licked her lips. In the courts of the Dark Prince, there is much discussion on the subject of pain. You are admired there, and they speak of you highly. The horns are lovely, Bile said. What message? She smiled. There was something of him in that smile, he thought. Perhaps the only thing of him remaining. A crooked smile for a crooked creature. I haven't sent it yet. I might not now. Melusine, he said warningly. She frowned and flexed her claws like an angry felonid. A demon whispered to me that you are marked and all that bear your stamp with you. She reached out and tapped one of the nutrient tanks. He twitched, torment half-raised. He forced himself to relax. Even you? Especially her, she said, looking away. But not me. Not yet. Not until I'm her. She pressed a hand to his chest. She came to warn you, and I followed. Why? he asked, curious. Is that not a daughter's prerogative? I wouldn't know, Bile said. He ran a finger along one of her horns. I cannot decide whether this is an improvement or not. He looked at the dissolving carcasses, dirtying the floor of his laboratorium. Who sent them? There were any number of potential candidates. The eye knew no lack of sorcerers, the sons of Magnus or Lorgar's fanatical brood. She laughed and slid out of reach. I don't know. Me, maybe, or someone else. There are entire races which spend their eternities chanting prayers for your destruction. There are worlds where to speak your name is to court death, and even one where you are worshipped as a saviour. Bile gestured dismissively. I have many enemies, yes. Which one in particular initiated this assault, child? If someone specific was after him, he needed to know. He had weathered such sieges before, and would likely do so again, before his work was complete. But the Legion still needed his expertise. He was too useful to kill out of hand, or so he thought. He glanced down again at the remains of the demons, wondering what had changed. Melusine shook her head. Does it matter? Would it change anything? He hesitated. Then, no. It was convenient that she had come when she had, but perhaps there was more to this than simple good timing. Her smile became sad. No. Even when the fire comes, you will hold to your path. I saw it then, in the moments to come. She turned in a slow, graceful circle, hooves clicking against the deck. Do I please you? Will she? Bile looked down at her. Unintended results are still results. Melusine laughed. An old pain flared within him. For a moment, a child's face, perfect in all ways, swam before his eyes. He forced the image aside, trying to concentrate on the here and now. The creature before him was a perversion of his art, yet another thing taken from him and twisted into something broken and useless. Had she come to kill him, that would be fitting, almost. The creature undone by his creation. You say such lovely things, she pushed away from him. Beware the future. It comes for you, lean and athirst. It eats away at your possibilities, narrowing the span of potential paths to but a single road. You cannot go back, but neither must you go forward. A singularly unhelpful statement, Melazine. He reached out to stroke her cheek, half lost in memory. As a child, he had seen in her the future. What was she now? I am but as you made me. Her face twisted as she said it, and she caught his hand, holding it in place. He stood at her, trying to find the traces of the child she had been. A new life, a new sort of being. The first of many, he'd hoped at the time. But then she'd grown and gone, vanishing into the vastness of the Eye of Terror. Then Fulgrim had cast down his edict and thrice damned Lucius had shattered the other biocreches. He smiled thinly. He had nearly killed Lucius then. 
not for the first time, and probably not for the last. He took some satisfaction from the memory regardless. He was perhaps the only being Lucius the Eternal truly feared, for Bile knew how to render a space marine down to his bones while still keeping him alive. He'd come close to reducing Fulgrim's favoured pet to shrieking lumps of red meat and hiding him away to spend eternity unable to do anything save think on his crimes. After that, his attentions had been diverted down her other more blasphemous avenues of inquiry, away from invention to innovation, to improve upon familiar foundations for the use of others. But still, he yearned to create, to craft something utterly unique. You were the first of the Vatborn, you know. A new thing under the sun, created before even the second generation of Primarchs I nurtured in Canticle City, even before I reclaimed the carcass of the War Master. He smiled, remembering. An experiment, a mingling of multiple genetic templates, including mine. I am a daughter of your blood and bone, she said. She stepped away from him and started to trace patterns in the condensation on one of the nutrient tanks. Yes, you are my daughter. The word felt strange on his tongue. Space marines could not breed, not without excessive modification or mutation. A check placed upon them by the Emperor. Another mistake. Why create such a race and then bar them from achieving their full potential? Fear, perhaps. Fear of being replaced. Bile had no such worries himself. Indeed, it was his intention to become obsolete. But not yet. Not until his work was complete, and his new humanity had no more need of his guiding hand. Am I as you expected? She asked again, more insistent this time. No, he frowned. Did you know that was the only time Fulgrim ever forbade me from indulging my creativity? He was horrified, or so he claimed. Imagine that, a monstrosity such as the Phoenician had become horrified by a child. I suspect that moment was when I began to take issue with that whole charade of his. Like father, like son, I suppose. He remembered Fulgrim, rising above him, serpentine coils rattling in titanic fury, the wrath of a god, or something close. He could not recall being afraid. Even then, fear had been all but burned out of him. Like parent, my child. Yes, so it seems. She had never called him father. He had discouraged such familiarity in those days, finding it distasteful. His attitudes had mellowed somewhat in the intervening centuries, encouraging paternal ties, aided in strengthening bonds of loyalty between himself and his creations. Perhaps if he'd allowed her to call him father, she might not have followed the sibilant whispers of the warp. Have you come to kill me, Melazine? She looked at him. I don't know, she said. She stared into one of the nutrient tanks. A young girl floated within, curled into a fetal ball. Is she my replacement, or will I be hers when the time comes? Her tone was one of accusation. He tensed. He did not wish to destroy her, but he would. She would not be the first product of his genius that he'd been forced to put down. There can be no replacing you, my child. Bile extended his hand, but she stepped back. He held out his hand for a moment, but then let it drop. You were my first, as you shall always be, horns and all. I dream them. Yes, he said. Her eyes grew unfocused and her shape wavered. His finest work, but his most flawed. Soon he suspected that she would lose all substance and vanish entirely, or else become unrecognisable. Why had she come? To punish him? Or to warn him? And if so, why? A scrap of filial obligation? More? Because someone or something had sent her. He did not believe in the dark gods, or any gods for that matter, but there were forces at play in the universe which he could not fathom. Why did you come, Melazine? He asked again. 
to warn you. I was told. I was told, and so I came. The look she gave him was almost pitying. You have so many enemies that they make war upon one another for the right to dictate your fate. He was silent for a moment. Then, good. If they are busy with each other, then I will have fewer distractions to contend with. They said you would say that. He almost asked the obvious question, but restrained himself. It didn't matter. Nothing mattered except his work. Let all of the galaxy come against him. He would endure, and his work would endure. You could stay. Your help would be welcome, he said. Why? she asked, as if reading his thoughts. My father's prerogative, he said. Paternal consideration was alien to him. He played at fatherhood, but it was motivated more by mockery than any deep well of emotion. Was this what the emperor had felt when he saw what Horus and Fulgrim had become? He wanted to hold her, to clasp her to him, until she was again what she had once been, proof of his sanity in an insane universe. Do you remember when I taught you the proper way to hold a scalpel, my child? When I showed you how to flance tissue from bone? She stared at the child in the nutrient tank. No, she said, and her voice was small, so small. His hands clenched, and torment whined in his grip. That something of his had been reduced to such a state infuriated him. She looked at him, her face a porcelain mask. I came to warn you, but I was too late, wasn't I? No, he said gently. No, I am still here. I do not like talking to ghosts, she said. Goodbye. And then she was gone, as swiftly as she'd appeared, leaving behind the faintest whiff of sulphur and cinnamon. The laboratorium systems flickered again. Readouts skipped across his overlay as the ship's systems returned to normal. The Gellerfield had experienced a minor disruption, but was functioning at optimum levels now. Bile suddenly felt tired. He leaned forward on his scepter, gazing at the nutrient tanks. Were these children doomed to madness as well? And if so, what then? Was it all nothing more than a lunatic's dream? Perhaps his mind had gone, after all. Perhaps he blinked, studying the marks Melusine had left on the nutrient tank. A word. Just one. Father. He laughed. As Melusine's words came back to him, Even when the fire comes, you will hold to your path. I saw it then, in the moments to come. Bile smiled. Yes, I suppose I must. Mad or not, he had a responsibility, a duty to bring about the next steps in humanity's long journey towards its proper place in the universe. The galaxy would burn, and from its ashes would rise a new people, his people. Whatever came, they would endure. They would persist. His children. Thanks for watching, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this. I've just finished Man Flare, which is the third book in the uh, Fabius Ball series from what this is from. It's a short story. Uh, there's about four short stories that are associated with that series, set between the novels. And, you know, it's one of the best 40K series I've ever read. And if you haven't seen, if you haven't read it already, if you haven't listened to the audio books or whatever, definitely go pick them up. I'll put the links in the description down below. If you use those links, it helps me. So consider going over to Audible and taking a, a trial out with them. Get the first audio book. Fabius Ball is just amazing. The Fabius Ball books are brilliant. And, uh, yeah, you can get the books as well following them links. It all helps. Anyway. We are back to normal production rates, so expect more stuff regularly again. We've had a bit of a, a slow couple of weeks, but more is coming. Thank you to everybody supporting the channel. You can see all your names going by as we speak. Uh, it really means a lot, lads. I appreciate it. It helps me do what I'm doing, and it's going to help, you know, get more stuff done in the future. And I've got big plans for big series, big lore videos, all sorts of stuff. So there's lots of fun shit coming, basically. And thank you to everybody supporting my efforts in that. You know, some of you guys have been there for a long time, and I appreciate every single one of you. Um, but yeah, uh, it's brilliant. 
and I, I, I appreciate it. I don't know how much I, how I can say it anymore. I do. You know, it's really great. It's weird as well. I don't understand it. <laughs> Thank you, nonetheless. Uh, there'll be more stuff coming up soon. Uh, please do remember to like the video. That really helps. Let me know in the comments what you think. I might do some more Fabius Ball stuff in the future. But Josh Reynolds, every single Josh Reynolds book is great. He's done a lot of iOS stuff, which I feel a little bit guilty because I haven't read it. But I'm just not into iOS and I've got other books to read. So I'm not going to, I'm probably not going to get around to him any, any time soon. But uh, tremendous work on Fabius Ball. A fantastic ending to that series. And you definitely need it in your life if you haven't read it. You will not regret it. It is truly, truly peak 40k. Yeah, so yeah, if you want mind liking the video, uh, share it if you know anyone who might enjoy it. That would be great as well. And remember to subscribe to the channel if you're just watching this video, uh, because uh, we do a lot of stuff here, and um, you'll 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 be able to keep up with everything that happens. So yeah, more stuff to come. Stay well, everybody. I hope you're safe. I hope everything's going fine, and I will be back again with more very very soon. Cheers. Bye bye.